I think we're good to go. Welcome once again to the last session of the OC24 2023 edition. Thank you for everybody joining and many thanks for everyone who has been tuning in for the last 24 hours. My name is Maria Koruk. I am an analyst at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, and I will be moderating this session today. The session will be looking at how organized crime might change and develop in the next two decades, and most importantly, what can be done to prevent and reduce its harms. The panel is titled Future of Organized Crime, Possible Futures, Possible Actions. And it will look at future trajectories of organized crime and discuss some building blocks of a global strategy to counter organized crime. We encourage the audience to type your questions in the Q&A box and we will take as many as the time allows. Please note that um, as it is a final session, at the end of the panel, the co-organizers of the conference will take the floor for some brief closing remarks. I would like to introduce the speakers. Uh, with us today is Dr. Phil Williams. Um, Phil, if you would mind turning on your camera for a bit. Um, okay, thanks, Phil. Phil is Professor Emeritus at the University of Pittsburgh. During the last 30 years, his research has focused primarily on transnational organized crime, and he has contributed to various academic journals and wrote and edited several monographs. Phil's forthcoming book with Colin Clark and Jason Blazakis, The Mediterranean Connection, Criminal Networks and Illicit Economies in North Africa, will be published in 2024. Today, Phil will present his report for the Global Initiative focused on the future of organized crime. Thanks for joining us, Phil. Our second speaker is Lorenz Pascoli, who you can also see on the screen. Uh, Lorenz is Associate Professor in Crime Science and the Deputy Director of the Daw Center for Future Crime at the Department of Security and Crime Science at UCL. Lorenz has a PhD in Comparative and European Legal Studies with a specialization in Criminal Law and Procedure and Philosophy of Law. He teaches organized crime and authored numerous publications on relevant issues. In today's panel, Lorenzo will talk about techniques to future-proof the law against emerging crime threats. Thanks, Lorenzo, for joining us today. Our next speaker is Shirlene Ching. Hi, Shirlene. Shirlene is director at Green Transparency and an international legal expert on strategic advocacy, working on a range of issues like our environmental crime, international criminal law, illicit trade, anti-corruption, and economic crimes. She is a member of Global Initiative Network of Experts and the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law. In today's session, Shirlene will discuss organized crime on a warming planet, strategic advocacy, and how to create a movement to counter the harms of organized crime. Thank you, Shirlene, for joining us. And we're moving on to our final speaker for today, Zina Benalla, who is an international expert in counterterrorism and peace building. And she has been working in violent extremism hotspots in the Maghreb, Sahel, and the Middle East. Zina has a long experience working with different stakeholders from international organizations to civil society, communities, religious leaders, traditional leaders, and policymakers across countries and continents. Today, Zenith will talk about the nexus between terrorism and organized crime, about mobilizing communities to counter these convergent threats, and about the implications of local action for global change. A warm welcome to all our speakers, and thank you very much for joining us today. I would like now to give the floor to Dr. Phil Williams, who will talk about the future of organized crime, and how organized crime might look like in 2040. Bill, the floor is yours. Thanks, Maria. And can you pop up the slides, please? Okay, it's a great, first of all, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, great pleasure to be with us fellow panelists, and thank you, Maria, as always, for all your work. Um, okay, let's let's go straight into it. I think I have 15 minutes, so next slide, please, Maria. Okay, 
Basically, I want to talk briefly about organized crime as a success story. Then I'll focus on four mega trends in the intelligence services. They're sometimes called drivers, uh, but I, I think mega trends is a is a good term too. And then I will try to identify uh, seven or eight features of organized crime in 2040 that I think result from these mega trends. Next slide, please. So here's the success story, right? If you if organized crime was on the stock exchange, it would be a very good investment. And I, and I think we've seen over the last 30 years, globalization facilitating organized crime, cyberspace facilitating organized crime. We've seen a lot of cooperative linkages, Albanians in Ecuador, that kind of thing, uh, Vietnamese in the Czech Republic. Uh, and many in many cases, these groups have developed cooperative linkages with local groups uh, and, and work together very effectively. We've also seen the move into natural resource exploitation. I think FARC was one of the, the early groups doing that. Uh, but we've seen others too. We've seen the subversion, penetration, or capture of governments. And I think that's reflected in the organized crime index with the number of states with state embedded uh, organized crime. And the final point here is that. Basically, organized crime is a wicked problem, and it's highly resilient. Uh, it's very resistant to suppression efforts by governments. Next slide, please. So here's the concept of megatrends developed by John Naisbitt. Uh, we have to understand the present to anticipate the future. And Naisbitt himself predicted several trends which I think he, he got absolutely right. I think a big issue on this is what are trends and what are anomalies and how do we distinguish them? So an anomaly can be, or something can be, can happen. It could be seen as an anomaly and you dismiss it, or it could be a harbinger of things to come. Next slide, please. So here's some of the comments about megatrends. Uh, I think last one's a Scandinavian scholar. And I, I like his comment, great forces that will affect all areas. Megatrends define our future worlds. They interact with each other uh, and they, they can interact in various ways, but they often exacerbate one another. Sometimes there are some counters. And then we also have to think about wild cards in a sense outside the megatrends. Um, but but I, I loved the movie, Don't, Don't Look Up. Uh, which had a very interesting wild card, and the, in, in the movie, certainly no one could handle it. Next slide, please. Okay, the, the first me the first mega trend is resurgent geopolitics. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, so I th I think the way the way the world looked, right? I think certainly in the U.S. and I, I I'm in the U.S. now. The US was expecting it to be a three power world with US, China, Russia, the three great powers. And instead, if you go back to that slide, what you see is the US is dealing with a, a close alliance between China and, and, and Russia. And I think that changes the game and it's very different from many of the expectations. Next slide, please. Okay. So the Russian resurgence, you can see it on there, I think has been a trend. Chi China's emerged as a great power. Um, then we have, I would argue the world is very much like, like 1912, two major blocks, uh, alliance systems. And what is interesting is Russia, China, Pakistan, North Korea, Iran, Syria, and Venezuela all use organized crime as an instrument of state policy. Next slide, please. Okay, so the implications of resurgent geopolitics. The first one is the focus has now gone away from terrorism, gone away from organized crime, and it's all about geopolitical competition. And then, as I said, some of these states use that as an instrument of policies. I like to call them the, the, the authoritarian axis. I don't, like, I don't like some of the other terms that are used, but authoritarian axis, I think, captures it. China, a major player, it's a 600 pound gorilla when it comes to global crime. 
Russia has used organized crime for many years. The, head of the, the Putin's proxy head in Crimea was a former criminal organization. The Wagner Group uh, was designated uh, as a transnational organized crime group by the US in January. In January. Pakistan has long used D-Company against India. And North Korea has become superb at cryptocurrency thefts, cryptocurrency vault thefts. Think then about civil conflicts too, um, number of refugees, Syria was the canary in the coal, in the coal mine. Uh, but I think the Wagner Group will increasingly be seen as the prototype here. Sanctions, the democratic powers use sanctions against Russia, North Korea and so on, Iran, but they lead to what Peter Andreas called criminalizing consequences and tend to, to increase criminalization very serious at a, at, a very, at a very large scale. Next slide, please. Okay, second mega trend, global climate change. Next slide. World warmer and wetter. Interestingly, I live in North Carolina. I put up something on the next door blog. Is anybody thinking about climate change? And received all sorts of abuse. Uh, and someone actually described it in the words I've got there, ho hoax, perpetrated by globalists and socialists and so on, um, which, was, which was very interesting. And that was the least offensive um, message I received. Next slide, please. Okay, so organized crime is a contributor to climate change. And I think particularly with illegal logging, which acts as an important carbon sink, uh, but also in other ways, illegal mining and so on. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, Maria, please. This is a great, a great article um, by Lucia Tiscornia. She's at uh, University College Dublin. And I thought a piece on climate change was one of the best things I'd read about it being an exogenous shock, um, leads to organized crime moving into new markets, price increases. And she, get, she, gave, she gives these great examples of shrimp in Bangladesh and avocados in Mexico. I, I, I cite earlier ones. Um, such as oil in Iraq, in Iraq during the U.S. Uh, intervention there became a dominant commodity and was exploited by criminals, by terrorists, by insurgents, um, by, by the militias. And I think that's the same kind of thing. So scarcity markets can become very important in this climate change world. We've seen in Sicily uh, the mafia infiltrate the green sector. I think that's going to be replicated elsewhere, particularly in some African countries. We're going to see exploitation of climate refugees. And I, and I hope Lorenzo will talk a little bit about this as part of the law proof in the future, because if we don't develop the concept and get it broadly accepted of climate refugees, I think a lot of people are going to be in a terrible situation. We're going to see also organized crime moved into the ex exploitation of green minerals and metals which is an extension of what's already done with gold and other things. Uh, we'll see these illegally mined commodities integrated into supply chains. And in some ways, some of these commodities will become hot natural resources. Next slide, please. Third mega trend, disrupting technology, disruptive technologies. Next slide, please. Profound impact. I think more than the industrial revolution. The variety of technologies is critical and the speed and the exponential advances um, are gonna offer ma massive benefits, right? Uh, I, th I think AI has already contributed to new cancer drugs and new ways of targeting cancer. So we're already seeing these massive advances, but there is also a downside. Next slide, please. So we have, we're going into the internet of things. Next slide. And um, with 5G technology. And, I, and I, I think we're moving towards what I like to call hybrid space, right? 
the, the distinction between cyberspace and real space is breaking down because we are connected all the time in so many different ways. 5G technology will, will make that much easier and much more instant and so on. Next, next one is super smart policing. Uh, organized crime will use all these new technologies, but so will the police. So we'll have super smart policing versus super smart organized crime. Automated vehicles, Europe has done some great work on this. Um, also affect terrorism, right? If you want a car bomb and you can use an automated vehicle, then there's no suicide bomber. You don't lose any people. Um, next slide, please. Robotics, big impact, I think, in terms of employment. And that's when Bell's famous notion of the queer ladder of social mobility uh, comes in. So I think that's an important factor. Next slide, please. 3D printing can be used in all sorts of ways. Uh, might be used positively. So if you can 3D print kidneys, which is on the horizon, maybe five, 10 years away, but 3D printing, if you can print kidneys, then organ trafficking takes a big hit. Next slide, please. Nanotechnology, again, very important. We can see it, we can see it making new drugs. I'm gonna turn my video off because I'm getting a message about unstable connection. Next slide, please. Okay, biotechnologists, Lorenzo's colleague, Mario Melbury has done some incredible work on, on this. Um, but I think the point is we, if we don't act now, and this is true in so many ways, same is true with climate change, then we're gonna get uh, what's been called a crime harvest. And I think you could get that in this, in this world of biotechnology. Next slide, please. Artificial intelligence, obviously the biggie, um, will probably accelerate cybercrime and provide all sorts of new opportunities for cyber criminals. Next slide, please. Quantum computing is going to be crucial because we've had a lot of theft of protected data. But once you have quantum computing, that data is no longer be, going to be protected by encryption. Cryptocurrency, the final one, some bit will be compliant, some bit will go underground. Next slide, please. So those are the mega trends. Oh, there's one more mega trend. The global crime is crisis of governance. Basically weak neoliberal states, right? I think only 25% of states are strong. Many states lack capacity and have functional holes. Neoliberalism, is at root of much of this. It's encouraged abdication of state responsibility for its citizens. And COVID increased the problem. Next slide. Governance is a balancing act. And I think you have to do all these different, all these different balances, right? The balance between govern, governors and the government, between responsibility and deference, and so on. Next slide, please. The problem is most states don't do this very well. The state is the prize of politics. And then, as I've already said, state embedded organized crime becomes endemic. Next slide, please. So organized crime in 2040, I'll go through this very quickly. It's gonna be a new golden age. We're gonna have scarcity markets. Some states will provide these umbrellas of protection. We'll have hybrid space, as I've mentioned. Organized crime will exhibit high plasticity. Markets will be fuzzy, what's legal, what's illegal. Networks will be hyper-connected. And we will see the use of technology as force multipliers. And then criminal governance will become much more pervasive. I'll say a little of each of these and then wrap up. So protective states, right? And state-sponsored, state-supported, state-protected criminal organizations. That's going to be difficult to handle. Ever since Palermo, we've had cosmetic conformity and tacit defections from the regime by some states. But collective governance in this, in this geopolitical rival, amidst geopolitical rivalry will become almost impossible. And you see in this already, right, the dilemma. We need to harness AI. But geopolitical competition between Russia and, sorry, between the US and China 
makes people unwilling to harness it because they're afraid of losing in the competition. Scarcity markets, organized crime will move into the staples of life. Detention facilities will be exploited. Migration will be the major growth industry of the 21st century. And we will see organized crime involvement in the green energy sector, big time. Next slide. Organized crime in, site, in hybrid space. Uh, Andrea De Nicola did a great piece on this, uh, and it, it's there. But essentially, right? Think of think of ransomware and DDoS attacks when they not just target things for money, but really try to do harm. Shut down heating in winter or air conditioner in air condition in summer. Next slide, please. Plasticity, the, in a sense, the resilience of organized crime, the ability to adapt is very high. We see criminal service providers, but sometimes be replaced by technology. I love and Andre Camieri's term, the shape of water. Organized crime will take on the shape of water. And just think of the alliances that develop, right? Chinese brokers loan the Mexican drug proceeds from the United States. Murky markets, blurry boundaries. That's going to lead to all sorts of additional complications. And I, I jump over, over the detail, but you can um, you can see it there at the bottom. Hyperconnected hubs and super hubs. Hubs have been given very little of attention, but I think you can see criminal hubs and what I and what I call super hubs combining criminals and logistics. And they operate at various levels. For example, I would argue Thailand's a super hub, and then Bangkok and Pattaya within it. And in Italy, I think Milan. Malta's a mini hub. Uh, Spain uh, is very interesting with the Costa del Sol. And then Marbella and Dubai are highly, highly connected. Emerging technologies, great force multiplier, industrial scale, social engineering. Um, one of the big things we're going to face uh, deep fakes, that's going to that's going to put cybercrime on steroids. Uh, and it, this will enable small criminal organizations to punch above their weight. Next slide, please. So alternative governance by criminals, we see in this already. Van der Felber Brown has written some great stuff on it. Um, my favorite example is the Lorenzana family in Guatemala. This was a family that, uh, in Zacapal, I think it was, they were the local patrons and they were drug traffickers, but they also um, provided, they, they, they provided flood relief, medic, medical care. Uh, they, they actually had a, had a, had a medical clinic, um, gifts for Christmas, uh, jobs, they really were the patrons. They were taken down by, D, by DEA, great in terms of drug trafficking, lousy in terms of governance, because with their removal, there was no governance in that area and the state did not step in. There's often, and I think there are four kinds of governance we could think about, formal, contested, uh, and alternative, and there was, there was one more there. But conclusion, organized crime is on a roll. It's going from strength to strength and it's going to be turbocharged. And thank you very much for listening. I'm sorry that was so rushed. Thank you so much, Phil, for the presentation and apologies for slight technical issues. Um, yeah, that's really fascinating, Phil. Thanks for really breaking down I'm sorry, Maria, I stopped hearing you. I can't hear Maria either. I don't know if you can hear me, though. Of course.
I can hear you, Lorenzo. Right, I can hear you, Phil. So I think we are temporarily losing Maria. Right, I see my slides up, so perhaps it's good <laughs> for me to take uh, uh, the opportunity to uh, start talking about my my presentation. So, first of all, thank you everyone for inviting me and for this uh, phenomenal conversation. I was very glad to see some friends in uh, the run up to this um, conference. So thank you very much. And I hope we'll have a, uh, and I'm sure we'll have a very nice discussion with the audience as well. So uh, what are we talking about uh, um, in my slides? We're talking about how to future-proof the law. And I think this topic ties very neatly with what uh, Phil just said, because uh, the Door Center for Future Crime, which uh, I am the, co uh, the deputy director of, um, focuses specifically on uh, um, studying how crime will develop in the future. So many of the developments that Phil has illustrated is our daily bread. But recently we started thinking, well, once we predict or once we can foresee the developments of future crime, what should we do about it? And the first point of uh, um, interest for us is the law. How do we shape the law in a way that is resilient to face um, future threats from organized criminals? Now, <clears throat> Before we move into the answer to this question, let's have a look to the complex relationship between the law and the future. Now, first of all, a very common uh, issue and very basic issue to notice is that the law always looks at the future. The law works for the future. The law wants to pre prevent undesirable futures and it wants to promote desirable futures, particularly by encouraging our behaviors. At the same time, though, we can't do laws in the futures for the past. So if tomorrow we realize that we have a problem, we can't regulate looking backwards, looking to the past. So the law is non-retroactive. So it's a complex relationship here. But, and this is complicating things even further, the law is always responsive, reactive. So we draft the laws of the future based on our knowledge of the past. And these can create contradictions and tensions between a future laws that come out already out of date. And this is because the legislative processes, but also judicial decision making and regulation are particularly slow. They take time, they take democratic debates, they take procedures, long procedures and so on and so forth. So, a slow lawmaking process makes the law out of date very easily. The final element of the law is that the law tends to be durable. So we want the law to last as long as possible, but then of course we make a law with the hope that it can last forever, but then something changes and the law becomes out of date. So we have a lot of contradictions. In all these, we do have an advantage though, which is the malleability of the law. The law can be changed. The law is not set in stone. Even if it's meant to be long lasting, we can change it, we can amend it. So what I will do today is to seek to understand how we can take advantage of this malleability to future-proof the law. So I've identified two set of possible strategies or technique. The first set is based on changing the norms. Now, basically, affecting, modifying, intervening on the way we write down legal rules. There are three main areas in this respect. First of all, law designs, so the techniques in which that we use to draft the law. Secondly, legal interpretation, how we interpret the words that are written down in these rules. And third point, what do we want the law to say? So a more substantive approach. So what do we want the law to prescribe and what do we want the law to prohibit? Together with these norm-centered solutions, we also have institutional solutions. Institutional solutions are basically not related to the way we write legal norms, the way we develop the law, but they're rather focused on the way in which we do the law in the sense of what are the law-making processes, what are the policy-making processes that are behind certain legislative decisions. 
So let's break this down. Let's have a look. The norm based solutions I've identified so far, but this is a work in progress, are first of all, the use of flexible legal definitions. So the use of definitions that are not too tight for them to be applied to future issues we're not aware of. So for example, we can talk about online content rather than talking about online posts because posts might be out of date in the future. So we speak of content, the word is broader. Related to these is also the second technique, which is technology neutral terminology. The more we mention specific technologies in the law, the more we tie that law to those technologies. And when these technologies will be passed or they will be changed, we will have an out of date law. So avoiding naming specific technologies can help. The third technique is principle based regulation. What does it mean? It means that the law legislation we set broader principles. So the law will express the main values that we want to achieve or protect. And then regulation, which is basically set of rules uh, dictated not by parliament, but by regulatory bodies from the government. These could be financial regulators, prudential regulators, communication regulators. They will set the details of the rules that will allow us to achieve these values and principles. The other um, object, the other strategy is purposive interpretation. So this requires a bit of creativity on part of the legal actors and means that basically the words of the law can be extended, can be stretched to include changes and in technologies that we hadn't foreseen yet. So for instance, if there is a norm nowadays that talk about cars or planes, in the future, that norm might be stretched by interpretation so as to include also spaceships or flying cars, stuff that we haven't foreseen today. Now, the final technique based on norm is so-called responsabilization. And this is concerning uh, basically the way we prohibit or prescribe certain behaviors. Responsabilizations basically mean that the law requires each of us including especially industry, industry bodies, industry regulators, companies, and so on and so forth, to take responsibility for crime prevention. By doing that, if the law asks someone, be sure you, you prevent crime in your business, by doing that, the law is also requiring these same actors to take responsibility to prevent any future crime and therefore to adjust their practices to any future evolution. So that's a helpful way that can be used to kind of make the law more flexible to future changes. Together with this, we have some pros and cons. So we, the, we, we, it's all clear that the main pro of these norms based solution is that they make the law a bit more future proof. Uh, other pros include, for instance, that there are less costs and less resources required at the parliamentary stage, because of course the parliamentary debates are much agile in these, in these solutions. And secondly, more adaptability of regulation to future situation. There are a lot of drawbacks though. First of all, the more we keep the law flexible, the more we delegate hard work to regulatory bodies and industry, especially in the case of responsabilization. Moreover, flexible laws mean basically ambiguity and contradictory interpretation. So if we use a flexible language in our terminology, or if we simply ask companies, you need to prevent crime, then we're basically delegating to them the interpretation. Then we can have one judge that interprets one norm in a way, one company that interprets another norm in a different way, and so on and so forth. And the final major point is that the broader, the more flexible the law is, the more power we delegate to industry and the executive. And these can create conflicts of interest, can undermine the democratic nature of the law, and can, of course, entail several risks for individual rights and safeguards. So a lot of caution is to be used for these solutions. What about institutional solutions or so processes? There are three main types. The first type is, of course, um, embedding roles, offices, and structures in lawmaking processes that are specifically dedicated to future thinking. There is an office in the UK which is called Futures and Foresight Office, which is precisely to advise policymakers on how to 
embed future considerations in their policies. A second technique, and this can take many, many forms, is reviewing legislation, re regulation very often, periodically, and in a very systematic way to avoid diseases out of date. This is not ideal, but it works. It doesn't prevent the law from getting out of date, but it keeps it on its toe through periodic reviews. And the final technique is broadening participation. The more we ask different actors, including victim organizations, NGOs, um, academia, experts of all kinds, industry, to participate in lawmaking processes, for instance, through partnerships or consultations, the more we expand the pool of knowledge that helps us predicting the future and preventing undesirable consequences. There are some pros and cons here. So the pros, of course, is that this is a much more systematic approach because it doesn't intervene on individual norms, but it intervenes on the way we do the law, the way we make and we create the norms. And therefore, it affects any area of law and policy. Secondly, changing the processes and the structures is ten tendentially more long lasting and durable than changing one single norm. And it, of course, it is more democratic because it doesn't affect the power we delegate to industry or government. Moreover, the fact that these methods require expert engagement, this allows these to rely on more evidence that is scientific and, 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 and reliable. There are some drawbacks, of course, and the first one is that this method is extremely resource intensive because it requires changing offices, changing processes, changing frameworks, and it inevitably, because of this investment, requires a long-term political commitment. So what are the conclusions of all this? As I said, this is a work in progress, so I'm happy to hear from you. The first conclusion is that uh, future-proofing techniques are not yet very well known and are still under-researched. The second conclusion is that norm-based future-proofing is generally more intuitive and more immediate, but has a lot of drawbacks, especially for the rule of law and individual rights, whereas institutional future proofing is more compliant with these rights and principles, but it is much more resource intensive and sophisticated. The bottom line is that we need more research, which we are trying to, to conduct at the moment at the Doe Center to promote awareness about these issues, assess these techniques more extensively. We, so far, we just identified them, and then formulate specific recommendations for policymakers. That's it from me. I, I look forward to hearing your question. Apologies if I run slightly over time. Thank you very much, Lorenza, uh, for very clearly outlining different practical solutions to future proof in the law. I found specifically fascinating the way of bringing stakeholders uh, to engage more and uh, actually open up to different stakeholders and different audiences as one of the ways to future-proof the law. Thank you very much for the fascinating presentation. And I will now would like to briefly um, introduce the process of the global strategy that uh, the Global Initiative has launched about a year ago and that Sherlyn and Zina are both part of. Um, so we were thinking about different ways to um, find practical solutions to counter organized crime and reduce the harm of organized crime to communities. Future proofing the law is certainly one of these techniques and solutions, but what are other ways and what are other solutions? Um, about a year ago, we started this process to uh, develop and, and formulate and build in blocks of a potential global strategy against organized crime. This whole process was guided by a steering committee of 12 experts who are based around the world and are part of GI network of experts. Sherlyn and Zeynep are part of the steering committee. And today they will talk about um, different ways to counter organized crime and will draw on their own work experience and how it relates to the global strategy. So I would like now to give the floor over to Shirlene. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Maria. Uh, thank you to the organizers for this kind invitation to participate again at this year's iteration of OC24. And thanks also to my speakers before 
uh, Lorenzo and Phil, thanks for your enlightening uh, slides. Now, I don't have slides today, so my apologies for that, but I'll take this 10 minutes of time to sort of go through my experience as a steering committee member for the global strategy, something that Maria has just mentioned, and also what I foresee at least in my field of work as the future of organized uh, environmental crime. Now, um, yeah, I've, I've had about 10 years of uh, career experience in the environmental field. I work mostly with uh, NGOs, nonprofits, but as of recent, I've also been working with Pacific Island countries as a legal consultant. My focus is very much on advocacy or legal advocacy. So here I work on campaigns for the EU, for instance. Um, there is also an international campaign to make ecocide an international crime. Um, I was also recently behind Vanuatu's initiative to take the issue of human rights and climate change to the highest court in the world, which is the International Court of Justice for an advisory opinion. Um, my focus really is very much on the impact that we can have with our campaigns, our communication, our advocacy strategies. Now I joined um, the Global Initiative as a member in 2017. And yes, I've been a steering committee member now for the past year, year and a half. Um, let me now share some thoughts on the process of coming up with a global strategy. Uh, Maria has mentioned that we are about a dozen of us. And I must say that it's very, very fairly geographically distributed. We met only in person once, which was last year. Um, the steering committee team is also very gender balanced. We're all from very different backgrounds. So you can imagine we're from academia, we're from nonprofit sector, law enforcement, uh, also private sector. What I like about the process is also that there will be a youth consultation and we have also reached out to some of our uh, youth fellows in the process of coming up with this global strategy. Now, of course, what is this global strategy about? This global strategy is about the intersections, the intersections of organized crime that some of us experts already know has been going on for so, so very many years, but also the intersection of actors. And what we want to try and come up with is a, an overview of the intersection of possible solutions that we can come up with in the coming years. Now, the global strategy itself isn't about presenting a strategy per se, but a need for one. So it's actually a call for a strategy, a call to action against transnational organized crime. Um, next part I'm going to is to talk a little bit more about the environment. Why is there a need to prevent the escalation of environmental problems, both in peace and in wartime? So if one can imagine a future uh, dystopian look of the world, you can already see it coming today. Um, we see the war in Ukraine, the devastation there. Um, we see we see the devastation, uh, let me see, an example would be the blow up of the Kabovka Dam. That one resulted in floods, that one resulted in displacement of communities. Um, and you can also imagine that war brings along with it a lot, a lot of damage. So you can um, think of toxic like uranium, lead, mercury. These are some of the things that will stay in the environment for a very, very long time. These type of con contamination we have seen in wars of the past, and it's still there. Um, illnesses, right? Illnesses that will affect the communities in wartime the vulnerable people during wartime. So these are illnesses that are both physical and mental. Um, we, it's unfortunate to see what is happening now in the Middle East again. Now, but you know, these things, war can have very serious and long-term effects on the environment. Um, this is probably why I'm working on the campaign to make ecocide and international crime. Um, another future scenario of 
environmental problems. Um, some of you may know that a plastics treaty is now in negotiations. This will introduce a ban in certain production of plastics. Will we then foresee, let's say, the illegal production and trade in plastics? We already know that uh, you know a massive amount of plastic have been traded as waste and have ended up in landfills and in rivers of you know countries very far away from the source of the plastic itself. Um, the Council of Europe is actually negotiating, as we speak, a convention on the protection of the environment using criminal law. Uh, Lorenzo spoke a bit about you know how lawmaking come comes to pass and this is going to be a very short process of negotiation where they foresee uh, a convention or at least a draft of a convention by summer of next year. The EU will also be enforcing uh, the corporate social responsibility directive. So this will implicate a lot of private sectors, a lot of companies. So how will this affect them in their reportings? For instance, ESG, um, environmental, social and governance reporting. What is the lacking data there? And um, from conversations with you know, financial institutions and a lot of companies, there's a lot of lacking data on the environment and also on, you know, social impacts. Uh, this Phil has actually mentioned, what about critical materials, right? As we shift away from fossil fuels, there is a need to shift away from fossil fuels. We will go into a greener energy transition, but what is needed for a green energy transition? Um, you can imagine extraction of rare materials in countries in Africa, in the Philippines, in Indonesia, but what is yet to be charted is the deep sea. Yeah, these rare min minerals that are embedded in our in our deep sea oceans, will they be extracted and what sort of harm will they cause? Will these open a black market in trading, for instance? Uh, and also, I think it was already mentioned, how about artisanal and illegal mining? How do these homogeneous products enter the market in the future? Who will be trading these, right? These are all minerals that are needed in our shift away from fossil fuel for the green energy energy transition, shall we will we also foresee counterfeiting in these um, minerals? So deep sea mining, uh, I just mentioned, is and hopefully will at least be banned uh, and or have a moratorium. Um, there are some countries who are pushing for deep sea mining in the open seas. Now, one needs to bear in mind that there's no monitoring in the open seas. We can't even monitor on land, uh, what more the open sea. So we can't even see to the bottom of the sea to see what's going on there. So this is something that uh, about two dozen countries are already against, and they're trying to delay, delay, delay the opening of the deep sea mining industry. Well, fisheries is something I would also want to touch upon very briefly. Um, we all know that there's already overfishing and also again, deep sea, it's also very, very uh, difficult to monitor in the open ocean. And also governments have, until now, still have been very reluctant to tackle illegal fishing. Now, organized crime is very fluid, already mentioned, is like water. So our angle should be one that can stop it in its tracks. So if it's water, how do you stop it? Um, do you build a wall? Do you freeze it? Do you contain it? Do you try and disperse it? But what I think what is important is we need to minimize the harm and encourage uh, learning. We need to do this by you know, offering alternatives to the communities who need to rely on certain artis you know, artisanal mining and uh, all these um, informal economies to survive, right? Education is very important. Awareness is very important. But more importantly also, when we're talking about big trade and big organized crime, um, we need to think about the facilitators. Who are the facilitators? We've got accountants, we've got lawyers. These are folks in place who could potentially open up the doors to you know, 
secret jurisdictions and, and, and banks and shell companies and whatnot? How do we regulate the regulators, the facilitators? Um, and of course, we definitely need to enforce the law. And if we can, amend the law, right? I think Lorenzo already pointed to, you know, some of the pros and cons of making laws. It's not retroactive. Uh, we got to look forward, but how do we do this? A law of ecocide is also not retroactive. It's more forward looking. But how do we counter this sort of reactive, uh, reactiveness to to atrocities, to reactiveness to uh, organized crime? How do we prevent it in the first place? But of course, um, my hats off to law enforcement out there. They are working, you know, very very hard to to try and stymie the effects of organized crime. So what about increasing the budget for law enforcement? I know it's easier said than done, but you know the political will needs to be there. The political will needs to recognize that organized crime is a problem. Um, I do commend the efforts of my fellow steering committee and also GI for heading up this, this initiative to draw up a global strategy that will inspire the need for a global strategy. Um, I really thank them for, you know, the, the, the report itself will be launched at the end of the year, and you will see that it will be providing some of the ingredients that will be needed for such a global strategy. It is a building block. It is an offer to work together. So as my last point, I would really say, and I really encourage you guys to keep a close eye on your email, your inboxes, watch this space, because once the global strategy is launched, there will also be an ensuing uh, plan to have advocacy around it and also strategic engagement around the strategy itself. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Shireen. Thank you for bringing together all these different topics from different types of environmental crime, to how they interact with the crime types and facilitators of organized crime and different ways to develop strategies against organized crime. And I just wanted to echo what you said about minimizing the harms and encouraging learning. I think those are two staples of any strategy against organized crime. Thank you very much. And I would like to now give the floor over to Zina. Thank you, Maria. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Maria, and uh, thank you, G Talk, for having me. It's uh, an honor to be in this panel, of course, with the distinguished speakers, with Charlene, Lorenzo, and Phil. Um, I will address the, um, the terror and crime nexus, but I want to answer first question, like why we should address, uh, why I, I am addressing this nexus. First of all, there is uh, an academic debate about this nexus between critics and, of course, acclaims. Uh, there are many references that you can, of course, look at inside the terrorism book, uh, crime terror continuum, uh, and, of course, uh, over hip in the relationship. So all these are references, you know, that you can look at that discuss the crime and terror nexus. Uh, between, of course, skeptics and critics and, of course, acclaims. But on the other hand, it's a major concern of many states. And uh, the, there are many UN Security Council resolutions that address today this nexus. Uh, if I remember, the first Security Council resolution was in 2001. And then we had one on preventing and combating terrorism, including terrorism benefiting from organi transnational organized crime in 2014. But there is an interesting Security Council resolution, which I will mention today, which is 2462 in 2019, and which, which uh, states uh, it's concerned that terrorists can benefit from transnational organized crime as a source of financing or logistical support, recognizing that the nature of the scope of the linkages between terrorism and transnational organized crime may be context. And this is very by context, and this is very important. And emphasizing the need to coordinate 
efforts at the local, national, regional, and sub-regional and international level. So the word context and local are very important because as a practitioner myself who lived and worked for many years in uh, armed conflicts and violent extremist hotspots uh, in the Maghreb, of course, and the Sahel region, and working at the local level uh, on global concerns, violent extremism, I can state that interactions between criminals and terrorists vary, and we can say are multi-fisted, but they are also context and region dependent. Therefore, responses must be local specific and engage in local communities. And this is also very, very important local communities engage in them. And it's mentioned in, uh, for example, the, uh, uh, in the good practices uh, in combating violent extremism uh, and organized crime at uh, The Hague by the global counterterrorism, the engagement of local communities is very, very important. So I believe if we are able to address the nexus, like with coordinated local actions that take into consideration the local specificities, of course, based on research in the field, that uh, of course, in different parts of the world simultaneously, we can produce a global change. So um, we see that the nexus, I mean, the, the terror, and also the terror and the crime nexus is a global concern, of course, as mentioned in many UN Security Council resolutions, but it needs to be addressed locally. And that comes one of the key messages of the global strategy, which is the concept of global, a combination of uh, globe, uh, a combination of global and local action can address the problem from, of course, the bottom up and the top down. And that requires a whole of society approach, which uh, of course uh, include all level of government, law enforcement, the private sector, civil society, youth, women, activists, the human rights defenders, political leader, uh, leaders, criminal justice practitioners, and the media. And uh, the steering committee you know, of the global strategy come from different backgrounds as mentioned by my colleague and friend Shirley from law enforcement enforcement, civil society, practitioners, uh, and academia. So I believe when you will read this document, everyone will find a space where they can act. And I think that can, of course, minimize the harms of organized crime and, uh, and, uh, what, uh, and also the, the, the mega trends that uh, Phil mentioned in his presentation. So, um, I can, you know, just to give you a few examples, you know, um, in the regions where I worked and I will talk, uh, I don't know if many of you know the region called Liptaku Burma region. And this region is between Niger, Mali and Burkina Faso. In this region, you find that illicit activities are essential to the establishment, expansion and survival of extremist groups. And uh, they take form of uh, trafficking in weapons, uh, drugs, uh, uh, motorcycles, fuel, cattle rustling, artisanal gold mining, and poaching. So violent extremists in this region benefit from that. And there are other regions, such as you know the Lake Chad Basin. And the Lake Chad Basin suffers also from you know an environmental crisis. And uh, I mean that uh, my colleague Charlene talked about in addition to the expansion of violent extremists and the uh, organized uh, crime. For the Middle East, very simple. We can look at the production and trade of uh, Captagon that shows the intersection of conflict, ter terrorism, and criminal governance and drug dependence. Uh, so uh, I can also, I will bring to the example of uh, uh, Daesh and uh, that kidnapped about 60,000 60, Yazidi women and girls. Uh, and here we see a connection between, intersection between human trafficking and terrorism. Uh, Boko Haram and the Chibo girls, you know, when they kidnapped about, uh, uh, I think, uh, 
300 or if I re if I remember to, to 270 girls from uh, from their school in Chibok. So there are several intersections that are that are worth looking at, and if we are able to to engage local communities in addressing the problem, of course, with local solution and. Uh, uh, I think we, we we might, of course, minimize the harms of organized crime. Uh, uh, I think um, uh, 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 these are like few examples from different regions, especially the regions where I work, that shows this intersectionality between uh, crime and and terror. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zineb, and thanks for bringing all these examples of intersections. I have to say the working title of the report or the title of the report that will be released um, on the need of the global strategy and the building blocks of such a strategy is intersections towards a global strategy against organized crime. So we are looking at all these intersections not only between different crime types, but also between organized crime and mega trends that Phil was talking about, between um, different factors that influence and enable organized crime, between the upper world and underworld. And we're looking at all these different uh, stages, and not only the underworld where crime happens, but we argue that crime is everywhere around us and it's not what everybody thinks it is. So just wanted to flag again uh, for the audience to stay tuned for the report, which will be coming by the end of the year and uh, you will be informed about it. So please keep an eye on your inbox. And now I just want to thank all the speakers and invite everybody to turn on your cameras and return to the discussion for the Q&A session. We already have a few questions. And um, I see Phil answered to one, of the, one of the questions, but perhaps you want to take it um, so that the audience also can hear the answer. So the question is um, directed to Phil and uh, Andrea Wigman is asking if 2040 is not too late for the scenario that Phil was talking about, so organized crime in 2040, because much of this can happen earlier even in 2026, 2028, or 2030. Uh, Phil, would you like to take this question? Yeah, I thought it was a great question, actually, and, and, and thank you for the question. Um, as, I, as I responded, I think 2026, 2028 are too early. I think 2030 to 2040, it, it, within that time frame, anything goes. So I agree very much. 2040 was was arbitrary, uh, an arbitrary date we, we just... Uh, decided to use. Um, and the trends are going to move at different speed. But I think by 2040, a lot of them will come to fruition in a way they might not have by 2026, 28, or even 2030. So I think that was the the, the argument there. But it was it was a super question and really made me uh was very was very thought provoking. So thank you. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, we have another question from Andrea Quatrin. Um, I will read it out. I think the point about facilitators is important. We often tend to look at crime as criminals versus law enforcement, but often don't pay enough attention to measures to incentivize and in other cases penalize facilitators, re remove um, their ability to operate sanctions, etc. Um, Shirley, would you like to take this question first? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Andre, for the question itself. I mean, or the comment, really. Um, I thought that it was very important to bring up the role of facilitators because very often they are, you know, operating almost, let's say, with impunity because of their nature of work. They are authorized to give some sort of advice. Um, I would definitely encourage you to try and Google something that the organization Global Witness did um, some many years ago already. It was um, a, a clandestine investigation into the world of lawyers in New York, and somebody had um, 
uh, pretended to be an advisor to a so-called minister uh, in Africa. And this advisor, so to speak, went to different lawyer, law firms, in fact, and asked a lot of different uh, lawyers advice on how uh, this so-called minister could money launder uh, his profits from the mining industry in the US. Can he buy a house? Can he buy a jet? Can he invest in something? And um, you will see from that video itself how very crooked uh, lawyers can be. Now, of course, if we were to look forward on how are we to prevent this, one could, of course, think about first incentivizing them to follow the law, right? Um, and also carrot or stick. Do you want your license to be revoked? Uh, as accountants, do you want to be on the blacklist, for instance? Um, all these JP Morgans and more, you know, JP Morgans of the world, they also need to watch out for this. Uh, they've come under a lot of heat over the past years for dealings with you know, corrupt ministers and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely think that once you know certain regulations are in place, due diligence, uh, corporate liability, those kind of regulations would be when they are in place, they would you know they would think twice about engaging. But this does not prevent them from trying. Thanks. Thank you, Shirley. Lorenzo, would you like perhaps to add something to this question you were touching upon the private sector in your presentation? Yes, I'm very happy to actually, I would have asked to do so. To do so. Um, the problem with facilitators is that uh, they kind of thread the, the borderline between legality and illegality. And uh, there are many problems with that. First of all, the first problem is that the law doesn't prohibit some of the things that facilitators do to facilitate crime. These might be because of good reasons. Sometimes we don't want to prohibit certain activities and we accept the unintended consequences. Other times it's for poor reasons, because the law is not properly made, because the politicians don't want to commit to prohibit some activities or because there are lobbying interests to be protected. So that's the first problem. The second problem is, uh, I completely agree with Sherlyn, we need to use a system of regulations to force facilitators to behave, to get back in line, so to say. But these works on paper, uh, in practice is more difficult because uh, what my personal research shows is that the more, uh, even the more advanced regulation that impose responsibilities on potential facilitators like corporations, businesses, lawyers, can be circumvented, can be evaded, can be, um, disrespected. So what we need here is not only an appropriate system of regulation, which is more complex to realize than we might think, but also uh, an effective system of enforcement. Uh, I think in my studies, I suggested many different directions for this. The first I would say is regulation or legislation must be prescriptive, must be extremely clear in detail about what companies and what facilitators can and cannot do. If we leave these to their interpretation, as I mentioned in the slides, we risk to have no grip on their behavior. And the second point is law enforcement is getting recently weakened by this trend of responsibilizing companies and, and facilitators because we tend to delegate enforcement not anymore to the police and prosecutors, but to regulators, regulators like financial regulators. These are inevitably much softer than prosecutors and criminal courts because the penalties they impose are mostly financial and they, fell, uh, they fall over the company. So we rarely put in prison or we apply substantial prohibition to individuals that are responsible for the facilitation. So until we repristinate an effective system of criminal enforcement, I doubt we'll see any progress in this respect. This is my two pennies. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. Um, Phil, I believe you wanted to make a comment. Yeah, just that Kim Thatcher could do the book on facilitators. Um, and, and with her co author, uh, Julia. Um, and Doug Farah has also written a lot on, on these. 
uh, facilitators and fixers. So just just throw that out. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Thank you, Phil. Um, and we have another question for Lorenzo in the chat. Um, is there any consideration when drafting legislations to factor the cost for organized crime investigations, persecutions, and so on as a restitution as part of the punishment against organized crime groups? So thanks for the question. This is a, a very interesting question. Do we keep into account the cost that is entailed by organized crime and indirectly by its prosecution? Now, the problem here, Jason, is that um, organized crime groups are not always prosecuted as a bunch, right? So unfortunately, the response of the state to organized criminal groups is much more fragmented than the group itself. The group is cohesive and they do activities as a pack, as a group, but the prosecution is completely fragmented. So it's very difficult to identify one entity that is responsible for any costs. And it's very difficult at the legislative stage to keep these costs into account. Now, one attempt in this respect is being done recently by what we call the third prosecution agreements, and these work only for commercial companies. So instead of prosecuting the companies, prosecutors give up and they say, we won't go before a criminal court if you pay a good amount of restitution, reparation, which can also then go to the state as a compensation for the costs of prosecution. But, but I doubt that this is a very effective system because sometimes uh, the cost that is paid back to the state by companies can be seen and even factored in in a budget as a kind of a side effect of criminal activities or as a cost of uh, doing criminal business. Moreover, this applies only to companies. So uh, an unorganized criminal group or a structure that evades the definition of a corporation won't be subjected to this measure. So I think you're spot on, Jason. We do have a serious problem that we do need to start factor costs into lawmaking, but this is extremely difficult at the moment. Thank you, Lorenzo. Sina, would you like to take the floor? Yeah, if I may. Um... I think it's also important today to rethink also the criminal justice system. Why? Uh, I was, I had one day, you know, I'm not, uh, uh, I mean, I had a discussion with like a prosecutor and uh, he said that sometimes you have the same persons that go to jail, go back, for, back and forth, you know? So he told me that when we look at this, we found that punishment or even deterrence uh, does not really work, but does not work. And when I reflect in interventions we use in country and violent extremism, especially I work on rehabilitation and reintegration of returnees from Daesh, from Syria and the Iraq, you know, and uh, I believe that we need more investment in rehabilitation and reintegration. But I don't think it has to happen only at the individual level only, but at the society at large. Why? Because, you know, most of the interviews I had with returnees, you know, and I give an example, uh, they say, yes, we want another chance, etc. But then when we go back to society, we are always stigmatized. So any positive action they take is always like they are very the society stigmatize them so this is why when i speak about uh, transformation or rehabilitation and reintegration it does not happen only at the individual level that's it but society at large including the criminal justice system as well and i think here again uh, of course, and it, it, sometimes they say that it, it does not work, and I agree there is a merit, you know, in that argument, because, but it can work with some, and it might not work with everyone, but I think 
investing in rehabilitation and reintegration, including, uh, you know, individuals involved in organized crime, I think is uh, important. And this is comes as one of the good practices mentioned by, for example, by the Global Counterterrorism Forum, you know, in the Hague uh, Good Practices document, it's mentioned there under the local engagement umbrella. And uh, of course, when we talk about the rehabilitation and reintegration, we are talking about the families, we are talking about the communities, we are talking about religious leaders, traditional leaders, and plus we are talking about building the trust between state institutions, including law enforcement, and of course communities and individuals, uh, uh, I mean uh, criminals and uh, uh, former criminals and former violent extremists. Yeah, so I think that's a uh, perspective from someone who works on the ground with uh, uh, individuals who are convicted in uh, terrorist uh, crimes. Thank you very much, Zineb. And thank you, everybody. Unfortunately, we have to wrap up the session. I would love to continue the conversation, but uh, we ran out of time. And I just wanted to thank everybody for your contributions and thank you for this great discussion. And I would like now to pass the floor to one of the co-organizers of the OC24 conference who has just joined us. Jay, thank you very much and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Maria, and uh, I appreciate uh, the opportunity. Just a, a few uh, parting words is this is the last, uh, you're on the stream of the last panel uh, strip that we have for the for the meeting. Uh, you know, keep in mind, this 24-hour conference uh, for this year was built on a very innovative idea. And of course, the idea is, can you have a conference with simultaneous participation from six continents and more than 40 countries? And we had more than 3,000 people participate over 24 hours. Panel sessions averaged uh, about 40 participants per panel with a, a wide range. We had a diverse group of presenters. Uh, we had 300 speakers from 40 countries. We were gender balanced. We had representatives from academia, uh, including early career academics, established professors, policymakers, and those serving in law enforcement and civil society as well. Uh, you know, we continue to innovate with new formats, such as documentary and book presentations, you know, intended to stimulate the exchange of ideas. I mean, we, we dearly thank all who participated, and particularly the spirit of participation with collegial discussions, exchange of ideas, viewpoints, and of course, global experience. Uh, the organizers stayed up all night, and we know some of you did too. Many thanks to speakers who stretched the boundaries of their working hours to join panels late at night or early morning. I mean, it shows your level of commitment to the subject matter at hand. We offer our thanks to all the people behind the scenes who helped make this happen. Uh, our communications and logistics teams at the Global Initiative and a large group of volunteers. For such a big conference, it went very well. And our organizers, student volunteers, and technical support were excellent. Many thanks for their efforts. Obviously, the virtual format has advantages and disadvantages, but think of how many in-person conferences you would have to attend uh, to see all the different people that presented at this meeting, as we did here in just 24 hours. We've learned a lot about what works and what doesn't, and we'd love your feedback. We will circulate a survey email to you after the conference. We also welcome emails to the Secretariat for suggestions and ideas. So once you've caught up on sleep, we encourage you to keep the momentum of the conference with you. Three tangible things. Reach out to speakers who you found engaging and strike up a connection. Uh, second, come back to the website. In a week or two, you'll find links to recordings of the sessions, your own as well as those you missed and resources uh, put there. Uh, consider joining one of our networks, ISOC, CIROC, ECPR, uh, to help you stay in the loop with what's going on. And I just want to thank you all for being part of a very unique conference experience. So th thank you all for being there, and I hope that you stay in touch. Thanks again. <laughs>